the next session is titled The Nuclear Deal with Iran, the Beginning of a Fundamental Change in the Relationship with the West? Question mark. Is that the case or is it simply a discrete achievement that has no broader implications for the wider relationship? That is the question this panel will address. And to moderate this session, we're very pleased to have with us Deborah Haynes, who is the defense editor of the Times of London. Um, she has reported over the years from a number of hostile environments, including Libya, which has been the subject, as you know, of much discussion here today and yesterday. And among her many distinctions is having won the inaugural Rat Up a Drain Pipe Award for her work on Iraqi interpreters facing the threat of death after working with British forces. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Haynes, who will lead this discussion. Hello, good morning. Um, so we're here today to talk about um, the implications of the Iran nuclear deal. And um, to do that, I have with me two very distinguished panelists, um, Sara Bazubandi, who is a senior lecturer at the International Political Economy, or in International Political Economy at um, Regents University in London, um, and is also an associate fellow um, on the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. Um, and so she will be able to talk very much about um, you know, internal affairs inside Iran, um, the economics of the sanctions um, being lifted, and, um, and also to talk about um, the diplomatic and security implications uh, of the deal. We have Peter Westmacott, um, who up until three months ago was um, the UK ambassador to Washington. Um, he actually just started his um, diplomatic career um, based in Tehran, um, speaks the language, and is married to an American-Iranian. Um, so has a, has a very, very um, in-depth knowledge of the, of, of the situation, both internally and externally. Um, I thought we'd start off with both panellists giving um, just their thoughts on um, the implications of the deal, whether it is a historic moment as um, supporters wish it to be, of um, you know, the, the, the relationship between the West and Iran uh, improving fundamentally, or, as critics would say, whether it's just a fudge and actually Iran has not changed its intentions whatsoever in terms of its nuclear ambitions and has instead managed to work out a way to get a lot more money into the economy, which in the end will um, enable it to be stronger in its supporting of proxy armies, while at the same time, in a few years' time, maybe eventually um, developing the bomb. So I thought we'd open up with their thoughts on that, and then I'll ask a few questions and then open the floor up to everybody else to ask some questions. So, Sarah, do you want to start? Sure, thank you very much. Um, in answering the first question, uh, whether or not the um, deal was or is uh, a historical moment in which Iran has completely transformed itself and uh, is reborn as a new player of the international community and um, having um, strong and serious intentions to change its regional strategy, um, or, or it's completely opposite um, and it's uh, just a matter of buying time strategy and delay strategy in the sense that Iran wants to um, resolve some of the economic challenges and come back uh, in order to pursue the previous strategies in, at regional, international, and even domestic uh, level. Um, I would say that this is a very um, early stage to answer this question because um, the consequences of the deal internationally and domestically are, are still evolving. And um, the two sides of um, the uh, debate, the supporters and the critics of the debate, um, are still um, challenging one another and there is uh, no winner in, in, in the sense that neither the hardliners who believe that it's a completely waste of time uh, and we shouldn't have had uh, gone back to the negotiation table or the ones that they think that we are the only way forward for Iran was to go back to the negotiation table and, and uh, pursue that. Um, they still are uh, at both domestically and uh, domestic and international level, they still are um, going through a, a challenge um, phase, a challenge period, in the sense that um, there is no winner yet. Um, what I would say, in um, my personal opinion, in, in, in answering your question, is that perhaps it was neither of these scenarios. It was neither of these. Uh, it, it's not going to be neither of these scenarios, and, um, and it's going to be something in the middle. So we're not a, a witnessing a historic moment of shift of Iran. We're not witnessing a complete waste of time, but we are seeing an Iran which is pursuing it, its um, 
expediency in, in pursuit of the establishment's expediency, which is a very, very strong political concept in Iranian domestic politics, the, the concept of maslahat nizam, which is the, the uh, expediency of, of the establishment. And that is perhaps the key driving force behind uh, what um, has happened um, in relation with the nuclear deal. Um, the establishment had seen itself um, somehow um, obliged to, uh, and seen its expediency somehow linked to coming back to the negotiation uh, table to resolve this issue. But it's not a, a blanket strategy that they're going to uh, pursue in every aspect of their life, uh, specifically domestic aspect and maybe to, to some extent a regional aspect. Um, the reason that the establishment see, saw its expediency in pursuing um, the, the nuclear deal uh, was um, as a result result of a number of factors. The first factor is the region, the, sorry, the internal challenges within the establishment. Many of the former or current senior figures of the political establishment within Iran, of the political elite, elite within Iran, have changed their views over the past few years. Uh, the best example are the leaders of the uh, so-called Green Movement. Um, who are from a very, very strong revolutionary background when at the initial uh, stages of the establishment of the revolutionary government in Iran, and gradually they shifted towards uh, a, a different, less hardline approach in their, in their, stra in their visions. Um, Rafsanjani, former President Rafsanjani, former Prime Minister uh, Mousavi, um, et cetera. Um, they, the other um, reason is um, that the military and the security apparatus inside Iran has also been uh, very fractured over the past years. Um, many people, many observers talk about the IRGC as this um, very strong one opinion institution that they, everybody agrees within the IRGC about their strategies. That's not the case in my opinion. Within the IRGC also we have lots of different fractions and lots of different uh, differences of opinion. Um, the, the next fact, the reason is that this, the establishment sees its survival in um, pursuing this strategy as a, as a matter of expediency simply because the new generation of Iranians are not the same as the ones that uh, were involved in, in the revolution. The people in 1978 revolution and 1979 revolution, um, sorry, um, are completely different in their visions and their strategy, uh, in their uh, mindset, sorry, uh, in compared with the new generation. Peter perhaps uh, can, can comment on that because he, he's saw this, uh, um, the previous generation of the Iranians from within Iran. Um, and finally, I think the experience and the lesson of Arab Spring was quite uh, sobering for Iranians and Iranian establishment in the sense that um, going for drastic uh, measures, on, whether it's domestically or in dealing with the international community, is on, only going to lead into a collapse, the collapse of the establishment, and it's going to only lead to losing what establishment has already managed to achieve in the region at the international level and domestically. So it's better to go back to, uh, to some of these um, uh, valid, re revolutionary values, especially in, in the context of the nuclear uh, deal and um, revise those. Um, I think I'm going to stop yeah, no, um, thank you. here and hand, hand the conversation to Peter and then we could um, have some more debate on various points. So what do you think? Do you agree that it's a bit of, bit of both, but in the middle? Can I say just a couple of words at the beginning about the significance of it and the background to it and oh. then I'll try and comment on that. I think from the perspective of the United States and the international community, this was a big deal. Um, I recall just jotted down a couple of points from the interview that President Obama gave to Jeff Goldberg in The Atlantic um, in the April edition of that magazine. Power is getting what you want without exerting violence. And secondly, diplomacy is a key element of United States power because when you have to use military action, there is always a sense of violating the sovereignty of another country. And I think, bearing in mind what we know of where President Obama comes from, what he's said about dealing with Syria and so on, this is for him a, a, the example of using American clout to get a diplomatic solution, not through military means, which for him is enormously important. Uh, he's looked at a number of other areas of the Middle East. He got elected to end wars, not start wars. But Iran was one of those issues which he focused on, and he gave John Kerry, and before that, Hillary Clinton, uh, and before that, in secret, one or two senior officials, uh, a green light to see whether there was a diplomatic solution to the Iran problem. 
and he also was prepared at key moments to shift US policy, which is one of the reasons why we ended up with a deal, which was that they were prepared to allow a modest amount of enrichment, whereas previously neither they nor the Europeans 10 years earlier had been prepared to go along with that. And it came about because a number of different things happened. Political change in Iran, of course. There was a lot of fiddling around with discussions between the Europeans and the Iranians and Americans and Iranians before the election of Hassan Rouhani, and everyone knew it was going nowhere, and everyone was waiting for that election, and then it happened. Rouhani was elected not as the, uh, as the first choice of the theocracy, uh, but because there was some quite nimble footwork by those people who wanted political change, and he ended up being uh, the guy who got elected, and uh, Ayatollah Khamenei chose not to fiddle around with the results as he had done previously and been criticized for in order to get uh, Ahmadinejad his second term. So you had political change there, uh, you had political input from the United States, you had comprehensive international sanctions, you had a declining oil price, um, you had several things which were, which were coming together and which were, I think, instrumental uh, in getting where we were. There was still the credible threat of military action on the table, even though many of us did not think that was the right way of solving the Iranian nuclear problem. It was out there, it was an issue. And I think there were some key elements of personal relationships, whether it was John Kerry and Javad Zarif, the foreign ministers, who got on so well that they are in touch kind of almost all the time on all sorts of international issues or whether it was at critical moments when the negotiations looked like falling down, or that you realized that you got two MIT PhDs uh, in nuclear physics in the form of Salehi and Ernie Moniz on the US side, who ensured that the detail of this thing was done, and who actually were very instrumental in persuading the politicians on Capitol Hill who tried to torpedo the deal, or some of whom tried to torpedo the deal, uh, that this was a good thing in its own right, not just because it was something that the administration wanted. So I think the, the nature of it, the fact that it finally was put together, despite the clock having to be stopped at the end, despite a lot of lobbying from a lot of people in the region against the deal, didn't like the interim deal, didn't like the comprehensive deal, the JCPOA came into existence as a landmark achievement, I would say, of uh, the Obama administration and an indication of his approach to international relations and of how US diplomacy can be used in pursuit of credible, achievable uh, objectives. Uh, what does it all mean? I think two points, I would say. One is implementation is going to be key. Uh, we've got past various milestones so far. The Iranians, generally speaking, have done what they're supposed to have done in terms of mothballing centrifuges and so on. Uh, the Chinese and the Iranians have got involved in pouring concrete into the heavy water reactor at Arak to close off the plutonium route. Uh, you, enriched uranium has been exported to Russia. You know, all these things which are part of the deal have come, in, have, have, have come to pass. Um, and I think that's gone better than many people would have expected. There have been a few bumps in the road, the testing the ballistic missile, we would rather not have had that, but that was almost certainly not done, certainly with the will, I don't know about with the authority of uh, political leaders, but it's an indication of the way in which Iran is fragmented uh, about this issue, and fragmented on the broader question of whether Iran should be heading towards normalization of its relations with the United States and the rest of the world, or whether it doesn't want to do that at all and simply wants to confine uh, the deal that it struck to the nuclear issue and getting sanctions relief, which was, of course, the key thing that they wanted. So that's my second part of implementation, which is are we on the West doing what we're supposed to do to give the Iranians what they are entitled to in terms of sanctions relief. This, I think, is a very complicated issue. Uh, it's complicated for a number of issues, partly because the sanctions put in place were so effective and so complex uh, and were instrumental in getting the negotiation started and I think probably achieved, though they had not been instrumental in stopping uh, the Iranian nuclear program themselves, uh, that they're going to be quite difficult to unscramble. And the second part of it is that, of course, the United States government has got its own unilateral sanctions applied to Iran for human rights abuses and support of terrorism and so on, which are still intact. So even though the United States Treasury team, whose job is to implement the suspension of the multilateral sanctions uh, on Iran, are beavering away and doing that to the best of their ability, they are legally required to apply unilateral US sanctions and to ensure that those continue to be applied. And that is complicated because a lot of international banks and other firms which wish to start taking advantage of uh, the opening up of the Iranian economy, sanctions and lift and so on, uh, are a bit scared because of the risk of falling foul of unilateral US sanctions because most international firms, certainly in the banking sector, the financial services sector, are active in America and active in US dollars uh, and they, want, they won't go back into the water unless they feel that it is safe to do so. 
Many uh, international banks have fallen foul of different US regulators, some of them US kind of government, Department of Justice and so on, but some of them state regulators, um, extracting large fines for penalties to do with transgressing sanctions regulations in terms of dealing with Iran or Cuba or Burma or somebody else. Um, the U-turn arrangements which allowed financing of business with Iran in dollars were stopped uh, and reversed and some people didn't adjust as rapidly as they should have done uh, to the change of those rules in 2007 or 8 or whenever it was. And so a lot of people got hit with very big fines and they don't want to go down that route again and so there's a nervousness which I think is affecting uh, the chances of getting on with business as rapidly as, as the people who believe in this agreement in Iran would like to see. Uh, there's also evidence that the freeing of the frozen oil revenues is not proceeding as rapidly as uh, the Iranian government would have liked. I don't know what the number is. Um, when we were all talking about why this deal should al be allowed to go forward, and some of us on Capitol Hill saying why it was the least bad of the options to stop the Iranian nuclear weapons program, uh, the opponents were saying, ah, oh, but there's $150 billion out there which is going to go straight into the pockets of the terrorists and the IRGC in Iran. Well, it was never $150 billion. Uh, that number was uh, an exaggeration. Uh, but I understand there probably was around 100 billion, of which maybe 20 is pretty bad debt, maybe 30 is uh, in debt uh, for other people, but there's a good 50 or 60 billion, which is Iranian by right, but very little of which has so far been freed up for the needs of infrastructure investment, recapitalization of Iranian banks uh, and other spending, and some of which no doubt would be creamed off by uh, the Revolutionary Guard for their own nefarious purposes. But that is moving more slowly uh, than Iranians would like, is what I am hearing, and I think it's going to be important if we're going to ensure that those who believe in this deal and want it to be implemented, and many of whom also believe in Iran taking its place in the family of nations in the future, should be able to point to uh, some achievements on their side in exchange for the fact that Iran appears to be doing what it's supposed to have done on the nuclear side. So I think implementation of this deal is going to be a little complicated. And then my last point, back to the question of you know, what does it all mean, I think uh, you're right, uh, Sarah, to say it is too early to say. It seems to me uh, with a certain amount of distance, but I also am in touch with a number of people who, who are part of the negotiation and the continuing discussion with the Iranians, uh, that uh, there are definitely people in Tehran who want this agreement to be part of the beginning of a broader process of normalization. Equally, there are definitely some people on the hardline side who do not want that to happen at all. Uh, it seems to me also that the overwhelming majority of, of the young Iranian educated entrepreneurial population who've always struck me as being much more interested in getting green cards and making millions of dollars uh, than in doing suicidal jihadi uh, uh, terrorist activity. You don't find many Iranians driving airplanes into the World Trade Center or uh, committing many other uh, suicide activities. These people would love to see uh, the opportunity to start doing business again, other than on the black market uh, and through Dubai and all the other kind of nefarious ways in which they've done business at very high price because of the, the prices you have to play, pay when the economy is uh, under those constraints. But there are, there are dark forces at work, I think, who don't want that to work. They certainly want sanctions lift because I think it is the comprehensive effect of US and European sanctions and the low oil price that have got us to this point, that have got us to do the agreement, uh, and that affects uh, hardliners as well as uh, the more open part of Iranian society and the Iranian economy, uh, but they don't really want to pay much of a price beyond uh, accepting the implementation of the nuclear deal, and they don't really want to uh, be responsible for what the rest of us want to see, which is Iranian behaving better in the region in terms of getting less involved in destabilization, less involved in proxy wars, less involved in financing and arming terrorist groups around the region, which is unfortunately continuing. Uh, and so I think there is a battle for uh, the soul of the revolution to some extent, and there's a battle about Iran's role in the region, uh, and there's a battle about the, the broader issue of normalization of relationship with the United States uh, and other Western countries. Quite separate from uh, the issue that the rest of us who have been responsible for getting this deal done uh, have got to address in terms of the anxiety amongst our Sunni friends in the region 
who fear that the Iran is now going to come out of the doghouse, become a more regional force, uh, more significant in terms of throwing sheer weight around, uh, more significant in terms of actions that they might be undertaking uh, in support of Shia minorities in other countries, and are fearful that somehow the, the Western countries, the United States in particular, has given up on their traditional Sunni Arab allies and has decided to back the Shia against the Sunni. That's not at all the way I see US policy, but that is an issue which is out there in the region, which I imagine probably came up during uh, the president's trip to Saudi Arabia and contacts with the GCC countries uh, earlier this week. So that is out there as well, the, the regional issue which people have got to address, I think, with some sensitivity. So all sorts of different elements to this thing which are relevant to the implementation of it and what it really means in the future. It's interesting what you say about, about the, the, you know, the, the length of time it's going to take for the impact for the sanctions to be lifted and for, the, for people to be confident enough to be able to do business again. And obviously that's, a, that's a, key, a key part for the people who are doubters inside Iran to not scupper the, pl the plan before it really has a chance to, uh, the deal, before it has a chance to, to, to bear fruit. And Peter, how long do you think it will take until um, you are going to see um, what the Iranians want to see in terms of the benefits of this deal? And I, I think it's, it's hard to predict. There is some change taking place. You're seeing lots of trade missions going from European capitals. Uh, you're seeing a little greater reluctance from US companies because US companies are, of course, still bound by US sanctions law, as indeed are the international uh, firms that I, that I mentioned just now. Uh, there is good work being done in implementing sanctions lift, but it has to be done separately from the legal requirement on the Treasury and OFAC uh, to continue to apply U sanction US sanctions law. Um, I hope that we will see uh, the freeing up at least of the oil revenues uh, more rapidly in the months to come. There's no very good reason why that shouldn't happen except fear on the part of the, some of the international banks who are holding those Iranian oil reserves. And I hope that can be unscrambled. I know that is the US administration's wish. There have been a number of public statements from senior US officials saying that we ourselves have to ensure that we are implementing the spirit and the letter of this agreement, as well as the Iranians. Uh, but it will take a little bit of time. There are moves in the US Congress to try to reintroduce additional sanctions legislation against Iran and some of the Iranian activity in Yemen and elsewhere and sending weapons supplies to Hezbollah and so on tend to fuel uh, those moves on Capitol Hill to try to keep Iran in a box rather than to allow, allow Iran uh, to become uh, a more prosperous country and, and a, a bit liberated from sanctions. So I think this is, this is going to take a bit of time. The Iranians can do a certain amount to help themselves, uh, but there are obligations on the rest of us also to ensure that sanctions lift works. I can't give you a timetable, but it seems to me, but there are more experts in this room than I am, uh, that it is, it is not moving as rapidly as many in the business community would like, mm -hmm. despite the large number of trade delegations that are uh, traveling to Tehran. So, Sarah, can you talk, um, uh, sort of obviously, the, 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 the de implementation began you know, at the beginning of this year. Um, can you talk about what's, what's happened inside Iran as a result? What's the effect been? We've obviously had elections, and we've seen um, a, an influx of moderate MPs to the parliament. Is that an indication that there is fundamental change, potentially will be taking place in the future? Or, or, or is it, you know, more of the same? Um, I think... What President Rouhani's administration managed to achieve uh, through the deal was, um, first of all, in uh, order to start the negotiation and get the green uh, light from the supreme leader, uh, was to convince him that the only way forward for Iran is to go back to negotiation. So that was quite a big achievement, and perhaps that was achieved even before the election of Rouhani. Perhaps this was one of the reasons that, uh, as Peter mentioned, um, half-heartedly the Supreme Leader allowed the election of Rouhani with 51% uh, only uh, of, votes, of the votes, rather than the actual figure that he probably would have. Uh, won. Um, in the uh, light of the very sad experience of 2009 election crisis, the Supreme Leader had, uh, was convinced uh, that uh, and they managed to, uh, Rouhani's team and uh, you know, people, um, like-minded people like Rouhani managed to convince him that um, 
the similar approach to in 2009 is not going to take us anywhere. So we, you need to to uh, have a, um, a you need to have a revised strategy in terms of allowing uh, more moderate elements within the political elite to go to the front line and resolve some of the uh, international crises. Um, that um, sent a very strong signal to the establishment, to the hardliners, and to the people. Um, the signal to the um, overall establishment was that we are not short of people who are capable to resolve international crisis, and um, yet they are uh, fairly um, they are fairly committed to to the values of the establishment. So they are not outsiders, quote unquote. Uh, they are from within the elite. Uh, they are very much dedicated to pursue the expediency of the of the establishment. Yet they know how to resolve crises. People like Zarif and his team um, are uh, managed to to. Um, establish themselves as this capable bunch of uh, Iranian diplomats that they are loyal to the system yet uh, understand the language and attitude of the international community and can achieve uh, certain goals for, for the uh, Iranian uh, government. Um, the message to the hardliners was that, um, especially in the light of the recent election, in which, for example, in the assembly of experts, uh, two very hardliner members of the clergy um, were outvoted uh, in, in Tehran constituency. Uh, something that nobody would have imagined would have happened um, until a few months before the election. Um, and quite frankly, Nobody inside Iran until this round of election really cared about assembly of experts. We all have always uh, were almost convinced that the assembly of experts is uh, the election of assembly of experts is just a show. Um, they are all selected by the supreme leader himself, and our vote really doesn't count. That's why nobody really had bothered to participate. So it was for the first time the young Iranian, those middle class educated who are in uh, keen on um, being a part of international community, saw this as a way to pursue um, their own vision in order to change certain elements of the political establishment through that election. Um, and for the hardliners as well, it was a, a signal, it was a message that they, in order for them to survive, they need to be cooperative with the more moderate element of, of the establishment and with um, moderate um, section, fraction of, of the population, simply because um, if they want to survive, they cannot continue uh, the, the more hardline and uh, the harsh um, language and strategy and, and attitude in the international community because that's not going to take them anywhere. They, they're going to lose more than they're going to gain, basically. I guess um, Iran is not the only place with hardliners. Um, Peter, what do you think would be the impact on um, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the early shoots that we've got of, of hope between relations of, between Iran and, and the West of a, of a Trump um, victory in the presidential elections. <laughs> Golly, um, I, I think it's fair to say that both the leading candidates on the Republican side seeking the nomination, both uh, Senator Cruz and Donald Trump, have been extremely critical of the Iran deal, either because it was a lousy deal and real deal makers would have done a better job, uh, or because it's a terrible thing to have come to any sort of agreement with uh, Iran and you've just got to crush the bad guys under your heel and close off all their nuclear activities and uh, so on. So both, both would like to tear up, renegotiate or whatever uh, the deal in a, in a manner that some of us would regard as uh, unrealistic. Um, uh, I think it's... it's who knows who's going to be the next president of the United States? You know, I'm not going to, not going to comment on that. But, but I think, uh, as of now, such evidence as there is does suggest that either of those uh, Republican candidates, and who knows, there might be a, a third-party Republican candidate who, who pops up between now and the convention. Now, that seems less and less likely. Uh, I think there will, you know, there will be some difficulties um, with either of those two winning the general election in November. That is not the case if we end up with President Hillary Clinton. I think the only point I would make is that I do think it'll be important for the rest of it, the P5 plus one, the other governments that negotiated this deal, uh, to ensure that whoever wins the election understands that this is not just a bilateral US-Iranian uh, deal. This is a, a deal which the rest of us put our names to and helped negotiate, and so did the EU External Action Service with um, uh, Commissioner Mogherini 
uh, as part of it. So this is, this is an international agreement which has been enshrined in international law by a 15-0 vote of the United Nations Security Council uh, giving its support to it. So uh, it cannot and should not be lightly set aside, and not least for the pragmatic reason that I personally, and I'm not alone in this, do not believe there is a better deal out there to be negotiated. Mm. So you're right to say that this would be a, a little uh, complicated in the event that, that either President Trump or President Cruz turned out President of the United States, but I like to think that common sense uh, and pragmatism uh, would prevail. We've got 15 minutes left. I thought I'd open up to any questions from the floor. If you'd like to sort of say your name beforehand. And anybody? If not, I'll keep asking questions, so it's up to you. Here's one. It's a gentleman here. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for the detailed answer you've already given on the question of additional sanctions and unravelling uh, sanctions. And this obviously is a key and for some people slightly unexpected uh, problem in terms of you know, getting implementation uh, through. And certainly in, in my experience, yes, you can go to meetings and everybody talks enthusiastically about the opportunities in whatever sector it might be, finance uh, or, or um, energy or whatever, uh, but then before you know where you are, lawyers descend on the room and it becomes very difficult. And that's for European companies as well as US companies, as you indicated. On the question of additional US sanctions and the non-nuclear sanctions, I mean, you didn't really go into any detail on that. I, I can't quite see, it's hard to see how they can be taken back. Indeed, maybe they'll be strengthened in some way. I mean, how big a long-term complication for the objectives that you have are those non-nuclear sanctions going to be? <clears throat> I think it's always been clear that this deal was about Iran's nuclear program. And the sanctions lift was always going to be about the multilateral sanctions, the European ones and the United Nations ones. And the United States government was always clear that its own unilateral sanctions, which were not related to nuclear issues, would have to remain in place until such time as Congress uh, decides otherwise. Um, I think that uh, that in itself is already complicated, as I was saying, um, not least for American companies, but also for European companies with major assets and major activities in the United States, which they don't want to either jeopardize or find that they are falling foul of US regulators uh, applying continuing US sanctions law. Uh, my own f suspicion is that as European firms, and, and there are some who are less worried about these issues than others, as European firms and banks begin to pick up more business uh, in Iran, I think there will be a certain amount of pressure to m moderate US sanctions from US companies who feel that they are losing out, that Iran ought to be, that Iran, American companies should be getting some business. I mean, that may not be black and white either. I mean, for example, Boeing have now got clearance to start sending airplanes to Iran Air, whereas Airbus have not yet got clearance because a number of the components which they have for their airplanes, even though aerospace is one of those sectors which is exempt from sanctions, both US and uh, multilateral, they've still got issues over, um, uh, over ITAR, ITAR compliance um, for the, some of the components which they need in order to build the airplane. So it's slightly bizarre that Boeing seemed to be ahead of Airbus, according to what I've been reading in open source material, on that issue. So it's not quite as, as clear cut that it's easier for the Europeans than it is for American companies to get on with it. But in general, I think it will be like that. And in general, I suspect that uh, US industry is likely to say, well, what about us? We've done all the heavy lifting. This was the fruit of two or three years of very hard, very effective bilateral secret US-Iran in diplomacy. There should be some rewards for US business uh, in a market where we used to be extremely strong and can't be changed. The problem with that is, of course, that it will require a better Iranian behavior on these issues if uh, sanctions are to be changed at, at the unilateral level on, on support for terrorism, on human rights, uh, and on ballistic missile issues. So I think uh, much of that will be in the Iranian hands. Meanwhile, We've got a number of initiatives out there on Capitol Hill, even as we speak, which suggest uh, imposing additional bilateral US sanctions on Iran right away. Uh, some of the suggestions are conditional if Iranian behavior doesn't improve. Uh, some of it is directly in response to missile testing 
or continuing Iranian support for proxy wars and, and groups of uh, undesirables in different parts of the region. The administration is not keen on uh, additional sanctions being put in place straight away um, without any linkage to future Iranian behavior for understandable reasons because they feel that that would be taken and the Iranian government has made this pretty clear as an indication of bad faith by the, uh, uh, by the Iranian side. So I think uh, additional sanctions would make things more difficult unless they are directly related to egregious Iranian behavior, which nobody could contest, uh, and which even the Iranians would have to understand, because it's all been made very clear to them, uh, that that's the sort of behavior up with which the United States Congress and the United States government cannot put. So it's a bit of, it's a bit of both. I think uh, Iranians know what they've got to do. Um, there are certainly things that happen in Iran that are done by certain players in Iran, which are absolutely not what people like Foreign Minister Zadie or President Rouhani even would wish to happen. Uh, that is the way that country operates. That is the way a lot of countries operate. Um, there are different, different factions and power bases. But equally, I think the, there is a responsibility on the United States Congress to bear in mind that the credibility of the deal is at stake if additional legislation, uh, which was deemed to be contrary to the spirit of that deal, was implemented. Um, the lady over there, and I'm gentleman there. Thank you, Peter, for that very comprehensive analysis. My question is uh, rather simple. Uh, we know that because of different layers of factors, um, the GCC was obviously not ecstatic about this deal coming through. And, you know, there's obviously the leadership of the Muslim Ummah, sectarian uh, issues, and the proxy wars that they have been fighting against each other for many, many years. So historically speaking, how much of an influence, if any, was that on this coming through? Um, and uh, going into the future, do you think this is something which is likely to uh, come in the way of seeing this successfully go through and for Iran to become a full partner within the global arena? Who would like to? Peter? Yep. Uh, just say, sorry, Minister, just, just say uh, once more again the, the point about the, the reaction of the GCC and what it means for Iran in the region. I didn't quite get the question that uh, the GCC obviously has not been ecstatic yeah. about this coming yeah. through, right? Yeah. So I'm just asking, uh, from your vantage point, what was, how much of an influence, or historically, when this deal was coming through, how big a factor it was for me to be able to basically see as to what is, uh, historically has been the role, and going forward, is that likely to be something which is going to keep this deal from seeing its yeah. you know, logical conclusion? Yeah. Um, I mean, and the, the last point, I hope not, uh, because I think there were good reasons to go down this route. Uh, some people who are analyzing the results of this nuclear deal would say this is an example not just of President Obama's administration stopping wars, but actually avoiding another war. Uh, in other words, that if there hadn't been a diplomatic deal, we might even have seen military action which was always, of course, on the table as an option should diplomacy have failed. So I think it, it was a very important development. I also think, I didn't mention this beforehand, but I think it is also the key to avoiding uh, a regional arms race in terms of weapons of mass destruction, which we could have seen had this deal not worked and Iran being allowed carte blanche, if you like, to continue with its own military program. So uh, I, I think for the region, it is an important development. I think for the region, it is a means of, of avoiding a nuclear arms race uh, uh, around what's going on there. The GCC countries, as you politely put it, you know, not particularly enthusiastic. Uh, some of them rather worse than that. Uh, they are nervous about what's going on. And of course, they are nervous to the point that some of them say to us, well, yes, of course, we'll help you uh, in Iraq and, and dealing with Daesh. Uh, and helping to stabilize Iraq, as long as you guarantee that the Iranians won't have anything to do with it, because we can't bear the prospect of any further uh, extension of Iranian influence outside the borders of Iran. They're already messing about in Bahrain and eastern Saudi Arabia and dealing with uh, Shia minorities in different parts of the world. You know, guarantee us the Iranians will have nothing to do with it, and then we'll see whether we can come and support your coalition against us. This is not entirely realistic. Uh, as we all know, some of the Shia militias in Iraq 
have been quite effective in pushing back against Daesh. Um, and some of the Kurdish groups whom the United States and others have been working with uh, have been supported by Iran uh, because there is uh, a common enemy there. These ISIL guys, these Daesh people, uh, dislike anything to do with Shia Islam as much as they dislike any other Sunni Muslim who doesn't think like they do, or a Christian, or a Jew, or a, anybody else whose throat they decide to cut for the fun of it. So um, there are common interests there, and I think that our, our friends in the, in the Sunni world have to grasp that there are reasons why we should try to engage together. All that said, there is anxiety, uh, and the Iranians do not help the cause by some of the things that they are doing in the region, which is deemed by their neighbors to be destabilizing. And they are concerned, and they have been concerned ever since the invasion of Iraq in 2003, actually got rid of a, a Sunni tyrant uh, and replaced it with what we see today uh, of what is going on inside Iraq. And of course, Syrian developments, uh, even the same thing. So, is there some way in the longer term in which, under US leadership, or more generally, we can engage with GCC states in some sort of regional stability process, maybe with Iran too? There was quite an interesting piece that Zalmay Khalilzad wrote the other day, suggesting that we could take the model of ASEAN as a kind of regional non-interference pact whereby people don't muck about in other people's countries, respect the rights of minorities, uh, establish agreement on the rule of law, and de da de da A number of different elements which would calm tensions uh, and perhaps reduce fears. Uh, I don't know what the right route forward is, but I do agree with what I think was your underlying premise, which is that the anxiety of uh, the GCC countries about uh, what this means, and, and, and letting Iran out of the doghouse, if you like, could mean for regional security. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. Iran is part of the solution. Uh, the local countries are part of it too. They need to understand that really uh, hardline responses to the Iranian government tends to promote hardline responses inside Iran and undermines the position of the relative moderates uh, who would like to behave uh, in a more tolerant and inclusive way towards the region and would like indeed to see Iran opening up to the rest of the world, in, in my judgment, in a way which would be good for m many of the people of, of Iran. So we've all got a stake in this, uh, but the regional security issue is a concern and the Sunni-Shia tension is a worry, uh, and I do think this needs to be a priority for our regional diplomacy, collectively. I think we've got time for one, what, one last question. This gentleman here. Thank you. Hassan, yes, good to see you again. Um, I, I want to ask uh, what will sound like a very strange question, and that is, are we watching the left hand instead of the right hand in this deal? So we know a few things. We know that Russia has been helping Iran with missile technology. We know that Iran has uh, quietly shipped missile technology to North Korea and been caught. We know that the North Koreans have been faster at developing miniaturized weapons and missile technology than we might have guessed. We know that we've gotten nowhere with China offering to help try to control this nuclear development in North Korea. <clears throat> we know that the North Korean scientists, nuclear scientists, were working in Iran. So what I'm trying to ask is, it, clearly there's an axis here of Russia, Iran, China, North Korea. And while we're negotiating this wonderful deal, is it possible that it's a shell game and that there's an agreement that we haven't seen which allows the North Koreans to test and develop weapons, which they're doing as fast as they can, which allows the Russians to share technology for missiles with Iran, and Iran to share that technology with North Korea, and all of which leads to a conclusion we don't want to have without them violating the strict rules of this agreement. Well, it's, a, it, it's quite a complicated uh, theory. I would make a, a couple of comments. One, uh, the Russians, in the end game, were very instrumental in getting this deal struck. Now, you might say to me, well, of course they were, because it's all phony and it's a shell uh, and it's a, it's a mirage. But they were instrumental in getting it done. Uh, they have been instrumental, of course, in getting rid of the enriched uranium, which has had to be exported from Iran and it's gone to Russia. So they are uh, part of the implementation of that. Um, the Iranians, the, the, the Russians are worried about militant Islam, uh, more probably about Sunni jihadism because of 
problems they've got in the Caucasus, but they did not want to see a proliferation of nuclear weapons in the region. Uh, we believe that. Um, it's not in Russia's interest for that to happen. So I think to that extent, the Russians were genuine players and constructive players uh, in this negotiation, even if there were moments of tension between all of them at different um, uh, times in Vienna and in, and in Geneva. Uh, the North Korea thing, um, I don't believe anybody has an interest in the Northern Koreans, uh, except perhaps Kim Jong-un uh, and his cronies in that program continuing. The Chinese are increasingly rattled by it. Uh, it doesn't serve Russia's interests, I don't think, because you never know who this guy's gonna point his missiles at. Uh, the people who understand North Korea better than me say that you could actually do deals with the father, but you can't actually do deal with, with the unpredictable son. And now the nuclear weapons program of Korea is even more wrapped up in the survival of the regime, I'm told, uh, than it was with the father. So this is more difficult. In Iran, it, it's not wrapped up with the survival of the regime. The survival of the regime is very important for the theocracy, but it's not essentially about the nuclear weapons program. Uh, you know, we've compartmentalized that, and the regime is, is continuing, and we're doing business with it. Uh, in, in, in North Korea, I think that is much more difficult. Uh, and yet, paradoxically, North Korea is the one that craves normalization with the rest of the world and thought it was getting a bit of that in an earlier stage of negotiation on its light water reactor, whereas Iran, or the hardliners anyway, don't crave normalization. They specifically want to keep the nuclear deal separately and keep the rest of their relationship with the rest of the world in, in its sort of rather limited capacity because they fear the erosion of the regime's authority if there's too much opening up to the rest of the world. So there, there are some quite important differences between the attitudes there. But I think my main point is to say that it doesn't seem to me that it's in China's or Iran's or Russian's interest to see the nuclearization of North Korea continuing. I think everybody actually, and look at the last Security Council resolution, you look at the language which China and Russia went along with, it was the toughest language we've ever seen of condemnation of nuclear weapons testing in North Korea. So I think, I hope your conspiracy theory is wrong. Um, I think we are all agreed that we're trying to deal with it. The slight problem is that we haven't actually got a plan that's working uh, to stop the North Koreans developing those nuclear weapons. Well, sorry, I ha we have, I've been told we have to wrap things up, sorry. Thank you very much for, uh, for combating that rather alarming conspiracy alternative theory. Um, and um, uh, thank, I think everyone would like to, for me to thank our two panellists for um, really interesting contribution to this um, still as yet unresolved question of whether the deal was a good or bad thing. Uh, although I think anyone will find it hard to argue with the fact that five years ago, all everyone was talking about was whether, when, or if Israel was going to be um, launching some kind of preemptive strike against Iran. At least now, diplomacy is being given a, a genuine chance. So, thank you ever so much. Thank you.